Hi everyone, I'm Dan Norton, a Chief Creative Officer at Filament Games and one of the founding partners. You also may have seen me in such films as Dude, Where's My Learning? and Highlander 2, The Quickening. Today, I thought I would talk to you guys about a topic near and dear to my heart, which is great learning games. Right? So obviously Filament Games is a learning game development company and we aim to make great learning games every time we set out to make anything in general. So I've been thinking about this for a very long time. I thought we could share some of the distilled thoughts about what makes a great learning game great in the first place. So just to give you a little bit of context, Filament has made a lot of stuff. We've been doing this for about 11 years now, actually. And it's great because over the years we've done games about many, many, many topics. And so just uh, just these little bubbles here on the screen, you can see we've made games about uh, engineering practices, cell structure and function, uh, dominant and recessive traits and Punnett squares, uh, underwater sonar, that was a great one, uh, systems thinking, and uh, lots of great games about uh, American government and civics. So we've made games that cover a lot of different things, and we've had so many wonderful opportunities to make great discoveries and make entertaining mistakes along the way. So let's sort of talk about how Filament approaches making these games so that they turn out not as uh, piles of junk. <laughs> uh, the first step for all of our games, all of our learning games, uh, start with the very, the very same first thing, and that's defining your learning objectives. That may seem sort of obvious, right? You're going to make a learning game. You should know what you intend someone to learn. But it's very important to get it documented right away. Get everyone to get a consensus. Understand what it is someone should know once they're done playing the game. Things that can go wrong if you don't do that is you may have different levels of understanding of how deep something should be understood or it's maybe the topic for the wrong audience or uh, even... You know, in some cases, there's there's disagreements about what that thing even is factually one way or the other. So deciding on a source and a pedagogy and a practice, making sure all those things are poured into your learning objectives so they're nice and clean and clear is, is absolutely critical. After you've defined your learning objectives, there's still one more step before you get to like wade knee deep into the gamey part. And that's defining your assessment. So... If you're looking for a real impact on players, not only do you have to declare what you expect that impact to be, but also how are you going to know that it worked? I know that sometimes the word assessment sounds like it can be a, a negative thing, but we're really just talking about what do you think is a fair way to decide that someone has been uh, positively affected by what you've made. So this doesn't need to mean that they're taking a, a bubble multiple choice test uh, or answering some true falses. You know, you can set assessments at any level of uh, evaluation that you want. But it's good to be open and honest about how you expect to assess your learner at the end so that that way you know that you're not going astray when you're designing the game mechanics. I think a simple and great example for this is the American driver's license system. In order to get a driver's license, it's considered fairly obvious that you definitely need to get behind the wheel of a car, someone should watch you drive that car, and decide whether or not you're going to wind up murdering people with that car or not. And if they think that you're going to wind up murdering people, you don't get your license yet. That seems very clear, right? You, you, you want that. You want to know that people have had a live, high-quality assessment of their driving ability. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure many people even feel like that bar could be raised even higher. It would be a sort of even, you know, a scary universe if we just gave people a written test and said, hey, take these 20 questions and tell us, tell us whether or not you can drive via this piece of paper. And that sounds crazy, right? And it is, you know, perhaps a piece of commentary that there's so many other really important things that we decide can be sorted out with pieces of paper. But this is sort of the time during your early design stages to say, hey, what's the, what's the best, most powerful way to assess whether or not we know a thing when we're done playing this game? And let's aim for that. Let's aim for that. Let's, let's go for that depth. Right? That type of depth will actually make the rest of your game design easier. It is hard to make what you would call a great learning game if your expected outcome on the other side is to take a paper-driven assessment. So we've got our 
handy dandy learning objectives all set and we've got our assessments and those are dutifully documented. Now is the time to start turning those objectives into gameplay mechanics. So when I say mechanics, I mean the rules that govern the interactions inside the game. So the things that sort of uh, drive the game to make it a game. Filament uses uh, sort of three core strategies for migrating learning objectives into gameplay ideas, uh, into gameplay mechanics. And I'll go into a little bit of detail on each of them. Very quickly, they are verbs, identity, and systems. So the first feature I'm going to talk about is identity. Games do this really cool thing where they ask you to step into a role, and sometimes that role is a named character like Cloud or Sonic or Qbert, as we can see here. And sometimes that role is a profession, some, uh, but they ask you to sort of merge yourself with some sort of identity inside the game. And players just say, oh, okay, that sounds great. Now what? Um, and that's really cool and interesting. It's a very unique thing to games. Uh, I often say that you know games are pretty unique and that it's very rare to see other forms of media that, that work with the player in the second person. Uh, you know, games talk to you and you, know, you do these things and you have these capabilities and, and players reflect on those things then in, in the first person, even if they are not seeing the game through the eyes of the player in a first person camera perspective, uh, they generally are given an identity and they react inside the game space from that identity. I think a, a quick example for from Filament is uh, we made a game called Prisoner of Echo, where you're given an identity uh, of a scientist attempting to escape a uh, underground and yet still in outer space uh, research facility. Uh, your entire identity in that game is wrapped up with the ability to understand and control sound uh, and so we have this blend of your scientific goals with your skills, and they all sort of speak to who you are and how you're empowered to do what you're going to do in that game. Uh, so if you have learning objectives that focus on how to see the world from a perspective that maybe you're not used to, or uh, how to embody a particular professional practice or a way of thinking or a way of socially interacting, all of those types of learning objectives may be ripe candidates for using identity uh, to build game mechanics. The next is verbs. I think most people, this may be the first most obvious facet of what games can do for learning objectives, and that games can create things to do, right? And they can create digital metaphors for doing all sorts of things. Uh, this is obviously a picture of uh, some fighting, which is a thing that games are very famous for being good at. But even in the commercial game arena, there's lots of games that are about traveling or being a lawyer and lawyering or cooking, uh, performing surgery. There's, the, you know, there's a whole wide variety of verbs that go into games and it's a very powerful thing. So a nice example from my filament game is Crazy Plant Shop. Uh, Crazy Plant Shop is a game that puts you in the identity of a owner of a kooky, crazy plant shop. Uh, you have customers who come in who require orders of exotic plants, and it's up to you to breed those. And so breeding, as the verb inside this game, involves using your uh, science fiction -y machine in the back to lay out the Punnett squares of dominant and recessive traits and breed the plant that you want. Uh, over and over and over. So that core verb of using the Punnett square machine in the back uh, lets you get a ton of great practice on on the ins and outs of dominant recessive traits and the Punnett squares that diagram them. So um, if your learning objectives have some type of action that you'd like the learner to be able to do, and you see a clear path to, to creating a digital version of that verb, then you can do, you know, a great high quality wrapper of scaffolding and feedback and empowerment around that verb and build your learning game structure around that with a lot of confidence. 
The last of our three strategies is systems, right? So games are obviously made out of rules and those rules govern how the player interacts inside the space and what does the game's world do in reaction to what the player does. Uh, the fact that games can make living dynamic sets of, uh, of rules uh, to create those systems you interact with is one of the really unique uh, and cool facets of game-based learning. So there's lots of classic entertainment games that you know, feature systems thinking as a premier facet of strategy. You know, games like SimCity and Civilization, et cetera, are some of the most obvious examples. Uh, Filament has used systems as a premier strategy in, in, in games too. So uh, we made a really lovely game called Reach for the Sun in which you are uh, learning about plant anatomy and plant function. Um, and in that game, you interact with a single plant as a system in itself. You decide which pieces of the plant uh, by anatomy that you're going to develop, and each of those pieces interacts with your ability to uh, generate and store resources. And you're attempting to manage your resources intelligently over the course of a year to try and uh, flower and fruit uh, before winter comes. So by using the system with an, a set of interesting inputs and outputs, we can get you to think about how the parts of a plant work together in a, not just in like, a, oh, I can identify all the parts of a plant because I memorize the terms, but you actually think of the plant as, as a set of things that work together to accomplish complicated goals. And that's very powerful. I think systems thinking in games itself is great because even if you do forget exactly what the parts names are and the specific terminology, you'll remember the overall puzzle, the overall shape of how those things work. And future work in the classroom or other learning environment, you have sort of a framework to hang more information you know because you, you know what it looks like in motion with the parts spinning and working with each other. So if you have learning objectives that are about thinking about an ecosystem or a complex interaction of multiple agents, anything where a system is a, applicable to understanding the objective, you might want to think about turning that system into a set of rules that govern the game and asking the player to interact with them and master them to be good at it. There is, you know, one thing to keep in mind in terms of the, you know, the naughty list, the things to not do is that if you ever feel like you've gotten to a spot where your learning objectives are an unfortunate tax or a an unpleasant piece of business and that you're hoping that your game is some type of uh, candy shell or frosting that can conceal what you hope they know, you're, well, you're basically doing it wrong. And uh, whenever possible, you should approach your learning objective content as it in itself is an exciting and interesting problem. And that knowing it has a purpose uh, and a context for it being useful in the learners, not only just in the side the game experience, but in their life. Um, if you decide that your learning content is in fact worthless uh, and that they're, you're using the game as, as, as an apology or an excuse to deploy that information, you're almost certainly going to make a game that isn't particularly fun and, uh, and also won't be educational. So you'll kind of fail on both fronts, right? You'll, you'll have made a not great game uh, that is not teaching. So to sum up, you should start all of your games with learning objectives that are meaningful and practical. You should have assessment so that you know how to expect what success is on the other side of the project so that you know what a player will be capable of doing when they've turned the game off and once you have those two things you can migrate those ideas into the things that a player does the way the player sees themselves and the rules that they interact with if you do all those things you've probably got a great learning game i hope that was helpful thank you guys so much <laughs>